In the rugged wilderness of the mountains, the enigmatic mountain lion, also known as the cougar or puma, reigns as a formidable predator. With their muscular grace and keen hunting instincts, mountain lions have earned their reputation as masters of the stalking game. The danger they pose to humans becomes all too real when they employ their age-old tactics, approaching their unsuspecting victims from behind before launching itself at its victim's neck. In these heart-pounding moments, the natural world's raw power is on full display as these majestic cats deliver swift and lethal attacks. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we take a look at three times a mountain lion attack on a human has turned deadly. Welcome to Final Affliction. Thirty-year-old Francis Frost lived in Canmore in Alberta, Canada. Situated 50 miles west of Calgary and near the border of Banff National Park, the area boasts world-class trails for cross-country skiers. One of those cross-country skiers was Frances. She and her family frequented the trails during the winter. A particular favorite was the Cascade Fire Road. She had lived in her parents' condo in Canmore for five years with her family, which included Frances, her brother Ken, and sister Amy. They spent Christmas there together every year, enjoying the beautiful winter slopes as a family. This year would be their last. During their stay, her parents had been out on the cross-country trail twice, each time describing the beauty of it and the perfect conditions for skiing. But Frances hadn't been able to leave the home to join them. Over the Christmas period in 2000, she was plagued by a cold. Only in the new year did she start to feel better, and on January 2, 2001, she decided to head outside for some fresh air. Her parents headed back to their home in Edmonton. Frances gave each of them a warm hug goodbye. That same afternoon, she ventured out onto the Cascade Fire Road to experience the perfect conditions her parents had been raving about. She clipped on her cross-country skis and set off from the car park. It felt good to be outside and to breathe the icy air after being ill for so long. She could feel her body reviving itself as she glided over the white snow. She beamed at some locals she knew as she slid past, but Frances was gliding into danger. There had been a spike in cougar activity in the area recently. The elk had been drawn nearer to town and the mountain lions had followed. That very same day, hours before Frances's outing, a cougar had stalked an Alaskan husky outside its home. At 3 a.m. and under cover of darkness, the cougar crept closer to the unsuspecting dog and pounced on it at the last second. There was a loud shriek from the dog, and the commotion as the two animals tussled woke the dog's owner. When they rushed outside, they managed to scare the cougar off and tend to their wounded pooch. The dog lived to bark another day. But more was to come. Three hours later, just after 6 a.m., Cheryl Hyde took her schnauzer for a walk. It was dark outside. The air was cold. The only sound was the crunch of snow underfoot and the occasional roar as a car rolled past. But in the stillness of the early morning, a predator lurked. It was on the hunt. When Cheryl thought she heard a footstep behind her, she wheeled around. There, to her shock, was a cougar following her. It wouldn't take its eyes off her. The faster she walked, the faster it walked, but it was gaining on her. She tried to remain calm and resist the urge to run. Then she came to a dead end. She backed up against a neighbor's fence, turning to face the cougar. It hissed at her and crunched down low. Unable to move and pinned up against the fence, Cheryl screamed for help. Gary Doyle raced outside and saw the cougar just three feet from Cheryl in a crouched position, ready to strike. Gary ran at the cat and scared it off. It had been a lucky escape, and Gary received an award for his bravery. The Cascade Fire Road that Francis was skiing along was a relatively easy route. It was a straightforward out-and-back track that was deemed suitable for all families, often receiving early-season snow in the winter and the first to be track set. It was popular and could be busy. The trail wound through the conifer forest along the Cascade River, 
A narrow wooden bridge took skiers over to the other side of the river and onto a ranger cabin. Many turned around at the bridge, but a few continue, making the route harder and much longer. Frances had set off just after noon. She had turned around on her route as intended and was heading back to her car. It had been a pleasant run with few people along the trail, but now, just 300 meters from her car, she was being stalked by a cougar. It had sensed Francis whilst out hunting and had homed in on her position. Now it lay in wait for her, crouched behind a tree that lined the track. It didn't move a muscle. It didn't make a sound. Its ears pricked as it heard the sound of skis sliding over the glistening snow, the sound growing louder. Frances wasn't only a keen outdoors woman and nature lover, she was also well known in the performing arts. She was a dancer at Edmonton's Ballet North Dance School and Performing Company and was honored to hold the role of dancer-in-residence at the Banff Center. Hidden in the shadows, the cougar waited for the opportune moment to pounce. Just as Frances had passed by, it leapt onto her back, its muscular limbs latching onto the young woman, its mouth agape. The 60-kilogram, 130-pound feline knocked Frances off her feet and sent her flying to the ground. Her face hit the icy snow, but she died in a matter of seconds. There was no way she could fight off the two-meter male once it had locked its jaws onto the back of her neck. She may not have even known what had hit her. The cougar then stood, panting over Frances's lifeless body. The swishing sound of skis appeared once more. It was another skier on the trail. He spotted the cougar and Francis on the ground and sped off to get help. As he passed other people, he warned them about the cougar and ushered them away in the opposite direction. Panic gripped the community as news of the tragedy spread. Park ranger arrived at the scene minutes later, where the cougar was still protecting its kill. They raised a rifle and pulled the trigger. The cougar fell to the ground. The attack made headlines the next day, but the young woman couldn't be identified. Her father had picked up the national newspaper back home in Edmonton. He couldn't believe the headline stating that a 30-year-old woman had been killed by a cougar in Banff. His heart leapt in his chest and he called out to his wife. The two of them read the article in disbelief. Terrified that it might be their daughter, Mr. Frost called her. There was no answer. He left a message. Franny, I know it's not you. Give me a call. Frances hadn't been carrying any formal identification on her. All that she had in one of her pockets was a card from the Banff Center, where she was a dancer in residence. Police managed to find out who she was, and that evening they headed to Edmonton. There was a knock on her parents' door. It was the police, coming to deliver the terrible news. They had had their suspicions because the description of the woman in the newspaper had sounded just like Frances. They had been trying to get in touch with her all day, but had failed. Her mother knew how tired Frances had been after suffering from the seasonal flu over the Christmas period and has since wondered whether that played any part in what happened. Had the cougar sensed that Frances was easy prey and perhaps in a weakened state? Nobody can know for sure why the cougar attacked Frances. She had tragically been in the wrong place at the wrong time. An hour or two earlier or later may have resulted in a different ending. It's rare for cougars to attack people unprovoked. A year and a half earlier, 150 habituated elk had been moved from the area to allow the ecosystem to recover. They provided food for the cougars, so the attack could have been driven by hunger. But there were known to still be significant numbers of elk in the area. A recent wolf pack had settled in the area and may have been competing with the cougars for elk, driving cougars closer to the town. Even so, it still remained an incredibly unusual incident. It was not thought to be the same cougar involved with the incidents earlier in the day. Head ranger of Banff National Park, Ian Syme, said that a daylight attack by a cougar is rare. An attack on a human is even more rare. And a lethal attack on a human is unheard of in Alberta. This was a first. Locals and visitors alike were shocked by the attack. Officials told people to walk their dogs during daylight hours and to stay on well-lit roads. Those who ventured out into the national park to hike or ski should do so only in groups. Families kept their children indoors immediately after the tragedy, 
and some were too afraid to leave their homes. Until his failing health caught up with him, Francis's father and mother skied the Cascade Fire Road every year in memory of their daughter. Despite the increase of cougars in the area, many residents still ski the exact path where Francis met her terrifying final affliction. At just eight years old, Jeremy Williams attended his local Cayucat Elementary School, along with his four-year-old brother, Daniel. They were members of the native Cayucat people. Their father also taught at the school in the isolated community on British Columbia's Vancouver Island. Belonging to a community steeped in tradition and rich in culture, Jeremy and Daniel were two of the 300 First Nation people living in the village. The rural, isolated community was situated 140 miles northwest of Victoria, surrounded by beautiful wilderness. Cayucat is the most northwesterly contemporary settlement of the Nootka-speaking natives. It is a fishing village. The food of the ocean has provided for the community for generations. The First Nations people came there over 4,000 years ago. They were drawn by the rich sea life, natural resources, mild climate, and the beautiful surroundings. But in those surroundings were hidden dangers. Wild animals lurked. Most turned away at the first sight of a human. But for others, they were bold and brazen. They posed a real risk, especially to those who wandered off alone. The close proximity of the school to the wilderness was a concern for parents. They had repeatedly asked school governors to erect a fence around the school and its grounds. They knew that wild animals were common in the area, and they believed that it was only a matter of time before an attack on the school children. Sadly, they were right. During the recent weeks, there had been more and more cougar sightings on Vancouver Island. The cats were naturally curious animals, and some had little fear of humans. They approached walkers, cyclists, and even wildlife rangers. The advice was always to stand still, wave your arms above your head, and shout. Never turn your back on a cougar and try and throw something at it. Any small children should be picked up. Typically, they will run away. Usually, they are just interested in something you're carrying rather than you, such as food in your backpack. But if they see you as the prey, then that is a whole different story. A mountain lion that is stalking you is not merely curious, they want a meal. On a Tuesday morning in May 1992, Jeremy was playing with his brother Daniel and their two friends in the school playground. Their father, who was one of the teachers at the school, was inside the building. He could hear the children playing and would sometimes look out through the windows and catch his two boys running around with the others. But he wasn't the only one watching the children playing that morning. A cougar had been drawn to the shrieks and cries of the young children as they played outside during recess. Jeremy sat down on a grassy bank on the edge of the playground, whilst the other children continued to run around behind him. He looked out at the surrounding woodland, but he failed to spot the camouflaged cat in the undergrowth. The cougar locked its eyes onto the small boy. It was a female, just a yearling. She was likely hunting on her own for one of the first times. Mountain lions typically remain with their mothers until between the ages of 14 to 21 months. As a yearling, she can't have been independent for very long. She was an inexperienced hunter, but an opportunistic one, one of the most dangerous of her kind. Cougars are hypercarnivores, meaning that they only eat meat. In Yellowstone National Park, they compete with wolves for elk and deer. Elsewhere, they also hunt smaller mammals such as raccoons, porcupines, and wild turkeys. But they typically hunt at night or during dusk and dawn. So why was this one out in the day? Perhaps it had had an unsuccessful night on the hunt. Perhaps it was very, very hungry. The cougar crouched down low, her belly inches from the ground. Slowly, she crept forwards in the undergrowth, her footsteps silent on the ground, her eyes unblinking. Then she made a dash for it, suddenly running from the woodland towards the boy. She covered the open ground between Jeremy and herself in a second. A flash of brown caught Jeremy's eye and he looked up and screamed as he saw the 60-pound, 27-kilogram mountain lion launch itself at him. 
He didn't have time to get up and run. It jumped on top of him, instinctively going for the neck. Her claws dug into his body, and the long canines pierced his throat as it mauled him. The other children screamed and all made a run for the school building. Some rushed inside, shouting for help. They knew their friend was in serious trouble. It was pandemonium. Jeremy was trying to fight back, but he was too small in comparison to the wild cat. He didn't stand a chance. The weight of her body pinned him down, and when she closed her jaws around his throat, he had just seconds to live. Kevin Williams, Jeremy's father, heard the chaos outside and ran to the playground. There, he saw his eldest son underneath the beige-brown cat, his head in its jaws. He ran at the mountain lion, yelling and shouting, trying desperately to distract it and scare it away. He tried to find something to throw at it as he rushed forwards, but time was running out. Although only seconds passed in reality, time seemed to stand still. The attack seemed to go on forever, with Kevin feeling powerless to stop it. Then the school janitor, also hearing the terrified screams of the school children, came running outside with his rifle. He lifted it, took aim, and fired a single shot. The cougar collapsed on the ground next to the youngster, but it was too late. It had already delivered its fatal bite. There was nothing Kevin could do for his son. He held the boy limp in his arms whilst his four-year-old son, Daniel, Jeremy's younger brother, watched on. The death of one of their own shook the close-knit Cayucat community. It was a tragedy that could so easily have been avoided. Richard Leo, a Cayucat Indian chief, told the authorities that parents were furious at the school board for not protecting the children from the threat of wild animals. There weren't just cougars out there, there were bears and wolves. Richard said that no pupils would be returning to the school until they had assurances that a fence will be erected around its grounds. Being surrounded by prime cougar and bear habitat, their children needed to be kept safe. A dozen children were in the playground that day. They witnessed one of their friends being killed right before their eyes. And for Daniel, he had watched in horror as his older brother was mauled just feet from where he stood. Professional counseling was provided for those children and there was an outpouring of support from the local community. It was a tragedy that will never be forgotten by those in Cayucat. There are some 4,000 cougars in the whole of Canada, 3,500 of which are found in British Columbia. Vancouver Island has the highest concentration of cougars in the world, with around 800 calling the island home. In the past 100 years, five people have lost their lives to the mountain lions in British Columbia. Surprisingly, all but one of these occurred on Vancouver Island. During the same period, 29 non-fatal attacks occurred in British Columbia, 20 of which were on the island. The majority of these were on children under the age of 16. Although these attacks are devastating for all involved, they are actually exceedingly rare. But it is the elusiveness of the cougars that makes them so terrifying, knowing that they are out there and that they are born predators with the ability to take down a 600-pound moose. Most Canadians will never see one, but for those that do, it often comes along with their terrifying final affliction. Kaylin and Wyatt Brooks knew the woods of Georgetown like the back of their hand. The brothers had been hunting here with their fathers since they could remember. Before either of them were allowed to lift a rifle, Mr. Brooks made sure that they could track, skin, and process every single inch of the animal that they were after. Only when they were 15 did they first get to shoot down a buck. The Brooks boys learned from the best, and they lived for the wilderness. Even outside of hunting season, they'd still go camping. Talon, now 21, had a packed schedule with college classes and keeping a part-time job. But on the rare occasion that he could get a weekend off, he'd stop by his childhood home to pick up his 18-year-old brother and their father for some time outside. On the 23rd of March, 2024, Mr. Brooks was held up at work, but Talon had a lucky break. He wouldn't have to go into work for the night shift, but Talon and Wyatt didn't mind. It would have been nicer to have their father with them, but they could get along without him just fine. It wouldn't be the first time they headed off on their own, after all. While the snow was still on the ground, 
The only thing available to hunt was the wild boars. If all went well, the boys would bring back one or two boars home to process, filling the freezers nicely until spring came and the bigger bucks were open for hunting again. But mostly they were there for the shed antlers that were all over the place at that time of the year. They arrived at one of their favorite camping spots, hidden just off the road in the woods. They spent the first hour chatting merrily as they set up camp, got everything ready for that night's fire, and set up dinner. They were planning on going back home the very next day, so the fire was more for warmth than cooking purposes. They had plenty of food for two strapping young men packed for them by their mother that morning. Since the afternoon was still young, they decided to head out to see if they could get one or two pigs before nightfall. And sure enough, they got a fantastic boar within two hours. They even managed to find three good-sized antlers, too. The rest of the afternoon was spent dressing the pig out in the field and carrying it back to their campsite. They left the entrails out for the scavengers to clear up for them. Wyatt was the one who brought the boar down, something he wasn't going to let his older brother live down anytime soon. They cleaned up in a nearby stream and headed off to bed for the night. While they slept, the guts and hooves that they left behind for the scavengers attracted its fair share of critters. Among the voles and a lone coyote, there was also a mountain lion. She chased the rest away from what little was left but the scraps were barely enough to fill her belly. The predator tracked the scent of the pig all the way back to the campsite where the boys slept, but she kept her distance. The smell of the carcass was tantalizing, but within that delicious smell was also the odor of fire and humans. She nearly built up enough courage to go up to the camp, but just then Wyatt stepped out of the tent to relieve himself. She slunk back into the woods and decided to wait until the men made a move in the morning. If they left, then she could get close enough to make away with a piece or a whole carcass. The night dragged on, but sure enough, the morning dawned and the boys were outside as soon as the sun came up. The watcher retreated a little farther back, never taking her eyes off them. She'd taken shelter right up against a boulder where a thicket of brushes grew high enough to shield her from sight. When they'd finished a quick breakfast, checked on the carcass and made sure that their rifles were in working order, the boys headed out again. But the cat didn't bank on them heading off straight into the woods toward her. She knew that the humans usually kept to the pathways, but now, with Wyatt in the lead, they were making a beeline toward her hiding place. The men were fast approaching, and the nervous cat let out a low growl. At first, Wyatt thought it was a truck passing by. They were close enough to the road that it would be possible. He simply kept walking, not thinking anything of it. He came just five feet from the cat's hiding spot before he even saw her. But by then, it was too late. Mad with fear, hunger, and unwilling to be cornered by anyone or anything, she leapt out of the bushes before Wyatt could even take up his rifle. Her claws were unsheathed, and she pounced with deadly accuracy. If it weren't for Wyatt's heavy winter jacket, her claws would have ripped his chest to shreds. The same couldn't be said for his uncovered face. The animal sank her teeth into the soft tissue of his cheek, knocking him over with the force of her full weight flying into him. Talon managed to get the chance to raise his firearm, but his little brother and his attacker were intertwined with each other that he would have shot Wyatt if he attempted it. Instead, Talon did the only thing he could do. He threw down his gun and launched himself at the screaming chaos of writhing limbs and blood. Talon tackled the beast like he would have hit an opponent on the football field. This time, the mountain lion was the one being catapulted through the air. In midair, before they even hit the forest floor, Caleb yelled at his brother to run. Wyatt, holding the flap that used to be his cheek to his face, ran through the woods half blind. He didn't know it yet, but his left eye was somewhere beneath his crushed cheekbone. With Talon's screams and the cat's wild cries behind him, Wyatt reached the camp in minutes. He grabbed the nearest phone from the tent and with his bloody fingers slipping on the screen, he managed to dial 911. 
Wyatt didn't remember it later, but he did manage to relay to the operator what was going on and what their location was. But then, with the woman still on the line, he passed out cold, finally giving in to the shock, pain, and fear that just overloaded his system. That's where emergency services found him lying at the door of their little two-man tent. Wyatt didn't regain consciousness as he was driven away in the ambulance. The team that stayed behind didn't have to search long to find Talon. Just a few meters away from the camp, they found him, unmoving on the ground, with a cougar standing over him. The officer's shots rang through the air, and she bolted back into the trees. They were not aiming for the cat. Like Talon, they didn't want to risk shooting the man instead of the cat, but it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Talon's throat had been ripped out, and his entire upper body was so destroyed that it was evident that she'd started eating at his soft tissues before they'd even arrived. The trackers found her before the day was out. The cat was euthanized, and her necropsy was done mostly to satisfy the necessary paperwork. When they found her, Talon and Wyatt's blood was still wet on her muzzle. There's no question that they got the right cat. Wyatt is still looking at more surgeries than any boy should have to face in their lifetime. He's stable and expected to make a full recovery. The entire left side of his face will have to be reconstructed, and there's no word out yet on whether or not they'll be able to save his eye. And, unfortunately, he'll be confined to the hospital for the next few weeks, so he won't be able to attend his one and only brother's funeral. Talon sacrificed his life to save his brothers, but tragically, it resulted in his terrifying final affliction.